Okay. I am continuing our study on depression, and um, so last week we we went over our case study on Elijah, and we talked about the fact that a lot of the times when we will feel the most depressed in life it will fall on the heels of a great success. Elijah had a huge success. He was um, there with all the false prophets of Baal, Baal being a false god, a god that doesn't exist, and... Um, so he had a standoff with them. He said uh, they built an altar and put a, a a bullock on their altar and they prayed all day way past the tam time of sacrifice for their God to take their offering. And he made fun of them all day and then came his turn made an altar, drenched it with water, dug a trench around it, filled that trench with water. Elijah. And then he prayed a simple prayer, and fire came down of out of heaven and consumed the sacrifice, the wood, the rocks of the altar, the trench and the water and everything. And... Um, it was at that point that he he told the people of Israel, today you guys decide who you're going to serve. Are you going to serve Baal or are you going to serve the true God? And many hearts were turned that day. And all the prophets of Baal ended up being killed. Well, that was a great victory. But Jezebel sent a messenger saying uh, the same thing happened to me if by tomorrow at this time you're not a dead man, basically is what she said. And he runs off, runs off into the wilderness. Runs off into the wilderness and then we talked about some of the ways that God got his attention and what God uh, instructed him to do afterwards. So what we've covered so far is that depression is a it's uh, an emotion, but it's also a state of mind, and it's based upon that which we perceive is going on around us. And Elijah running off into the wilderness after such a huge success knowing that God was on his side, knowing that, you know, all he had to do was pray and God would do great things. That was like way out of, it seems like way out of character. But it happens to us all the time as human beings because we tend to think of life as we sense it. And we've already discussed the fact that my definition of depression is um, how that we get a perverted sense of what's real in life, or if I put it another way, uh, an inaccurate view of what is essential. Sometimes we think that the important things in life are things that are not eternal and things that will have no impact on our future. And um, so we've gone over that. And what I want to talk to you today about, well, let me start out. Let me start out by telling you about one of my chihuahuas. One of my chihuahuas gets depressed. And there's a source for his depression. It's flies. <laughs> Whenever there's a fly in the house, he goes and hides under a blanket, crawls under, uh, gets up under a kitchen chair, and he will not come out. 
even if I kill the fly. I kill the fly and I remove the source of his problem, right? Completely remove it. I remove the source of what's causing him stress and anxiety because he's just, I don't know why, but he's just scared to death of flies. Even when I remove the source, he'll go, he'll still remain depressed and, and wants to go and hide and stay covered up until something comes along to take his mind off of it. And um, the reason I bring that up is because I was having a little problem with him this morning, even though I didn't see any flies around. He did not want to go into his house when I was ready to leave for church. And I found a praying mantis crawling around his, his house. So I removed the praying mantis. I got rid of the source of his problem. But do you think he went into his house happy? No, not at all. He was still depressed and still crawled under, trying to run away from his problem. Depression comes upon us as human beings a lot of times because, like Elijah, when problems come into our life, our first instinct is to get away from them to run or to hide and not to have to deal with them. The things that cause us stress and anxiety and, and sorrow and heartache, we, we would rather not deal with them. But even if you remove the source of your problem, it would not take away your depression. Depression is a process that takes place in our lives uh, over a period of time. So to come out from depression, especially when once we reach clinical depression, it's going to take some time. It's going to take some time and it's going to take us following the example of uh, Elijah, the example of David, um, other examples in the Bible of how people should conquer depression and should overcome it. And that is by faith, turning to the, to the Lord and following Him in obedience no matter what our life seems like right now. And I was hoping to finish up with this today, but I, during study, I, I just, I got a lot of material to go over. So let's talk about symptoms of depression, first of all. A loss of energy and motivation. Even the simplest movement or task seems overwhelming seems too difficult. Another symptom of depression, difficulty going to work or taking care of daily responsibilities. Another symptom that you're depressed, illogical negative feelings. Remember, we are the children of God and we are ordained priests and kings in the kingdom of God and we are here under the power and the authority that Jesus Christ bought for us by his shed blood on the cross. Of all people, we should be the most happy and the most, if you can put it this way, in control. We're not really in control. God's in control. But by his grace, control comes into our life. And but we get these illogical perception of what's going on in life and this illogical view uh, of what our life is about. And this brings on negative feelings that just seem to come out of nowhere. 
If you've ever known anybody that just, you know, out of the blue just suddenly starts crying and says, I don't know why this just came over me, or if you've had it happen to you. If you've had occasions in life when, you know, you're you're going through something happy. Maybe you're at a birthday party and everything seems to be fine and all of a sudden these illogical emotions just overwhelm you and you're brought down into the pits of sadness and you just can't seem to escape. And um, another symptom, of course, there are uh, there is the physical aspect. There are physical sy symptoms. Loss of appetite, digestive problems, headaches, migraines. If you are experiencing any of these things, uh, you can suspect that you're experiencing some form of depression, whether it's mild, moderate, or severe. But the big giveaway, the one thing that will for sure you know you're depressed when you lose interest in the things that you once enjoyed. When you lose your joy in the things that made you happy. When those things that you've always enjoyed doing, now you don't even want to mess with, or it just, just seems like too much of a burden to have to, to do, you know for sure that you are sad and most likely you are depressed. Now, if we go to a, a common mainstream church um, teaching God's Word and godly principles about depression, um, a lot of ministers will tell you that depression... has everything to do about sin. When we sin, then that brings on those uh, elements in life which brings these symptoms of depression into our life. And um, so, you know, we try to make it really basic in a lot of churches and say, well, sin is the cause of depression. And if we eliminate the sin, then we eliminate the depression and we bring the joy back by, uh, through God's Word, learning God's Word, and um, once again living as a godly person. And that is, you know, at the basic source, that's true to an extent. But that is not something that most people readily comprehend. It's not something that people understand as a way to climb out of their depression. You know, well, my sins and the sins of other people and the sins that are in the world, they truly are the cause of our depression. But... Just by reading God's Word, just by doing good deeds, that's not going to be the thing that's going to bring us out of our depression. And um, by the way, another big giveaway in the symptoms of depression is that you may have suicidal thoughts. And just to lighten things up for a moment here. Here's a little joke. I was so depressed last night, so I called a lifeline. And they've got this new call center in Pakistan. I told them that I felt suicidal. They, all, they got all excited and asked if I could drive a truck. You guys watch that 
that show on TV, don't you? Deadliest road truckers or something like that. Sometimes depression can seem silly, but it is actually such a devastating part of our lives when it hits us. And we need to learn how to climb out of it using the format that God has placed before us, using God's Word. And so let's talk for a moment about causes of depression. There are, of course, medical issues that can cause depression, uh, thyroid pro problems, postpartum depression after you have a baby, uh, chemical imbalances, certain medications that are supposed to be for depression can actually cause depression. It's one of the side effects. Um, seasonal affective disorder, which is simply, you know, some people get sad at Christmas time. Um, some people get sad at summertime. Uh, especially if there's another event attached to it. Like if you lost a loved one at Christmas time and then Christmas comes around, you tend to get a little sad at that time. Grieving the loss of a loved one can bring about depression in our lives. Highly stressful or sad events can bring depression into our lives. Ongoing stress, such as family problems. Family problems. Now remember, go back to my dog. I didn't quite get my recording down far enough to so you could see family problems, but it's on there. Jezebel. Elijah was running from Jezebel. So, anyway, we have these ongoing stresses and pro problems in our family, and we think the quick fix is to remove the source of the problem, right? Remove the source of the pain. If our husband's giving us problems, boot him out. If our wife's giving us problems, don't let the screen door hit you. If our kids are giving us problems, can I give you some money to help you get an apartment? <laughs> but you know what? If you're having family problems that are causing you stress, that leads to sadness, that can lead to depression, getting rid of the source is not the cure for depression. You can boot everybody out of the house and you'll still be under your blanket hiding from the problem. We need a sure solution, a sure way to get over our depression and to get on back on with our lives the way that God intended. Okay, so um, we, we talked about Elijah as a case study. Elijah is a was a prophet of God and a sufferer of extreme depression. So now we'll talk a little bit about him and uh, what we read out of the Bible last week and what he went through. He was in a stressful situation, no doubt about it. He was a man of God, a prophet of God, surrounded by over 400 prophets of Baal and a whole kingdom of people that were following idol worship because their leaders told them to and because these false prophets were, of course, paid by the state, ate at Jezebel's table, had a lot of authority and power, so he really stuck his neck out there when he challenged them 
to see who the real God is. And that day when he told Israel, choose this day who you're going to serve, Baal or Jehovah. Um, verse 1 through 2. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so let the gods do to me and more also if I don't make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. If you're not a dead man by this time tomorrow, then so let my life be forfeit is basically what she said. This is the stressor that caused Elijah to start to run. Now he had extreme anxiety, extreme fear, and he was going to try and run from his problem. So the first, his first instinct is just like any one of us. It was withdrawal. It was like my dog to hide under the blanket to try and get as far away from the source of pain as possible. That's our, that's our human instinct. But as we discussed earlier, getting away from the source of the problem doesn't cure the depression that the problem cause, causes. Okay, so verse 3. When he saw that he... When he when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there, left his apprentice there. He ran off by himself, off into the wilderness. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a solitary broom tree. Okay, what was his next... Uh, by the way, he traveled 84 miles, which at that time, walking by foot, he set quite a distance between himself and what he thought to be the source of his problems. Uh, if you figure the average by foot, the average human, healthy human can travel about 20 miles a day. He traveled 84 miles into the wilderness to a different country, to Judah. Not a city, but in the wilderness of Judah. He didn't take his servant with him. Okay, the next thing that started happening within Elijah's head and that will often happen to us as human beings who suffer depression he started thinking about death. Verse 4, And he prayed that he might die, and said, It is enough now, Lord, take my life. Anybody ever felt that way? Lord, I've just been through enough. I can't take one more thing. If you want to take me now, I'm ready. Or what's even worse is that we would become so sad and so depressed and want so much to get away from our problems that we would be willing to even take our own life. This is where Elijah was. That was uh, his mode of thinking at the time. So first he tried to withdraw, run away from his problem. Um... And then he started thinking about death, even suicide. Next came feelings of unworthiness. Feelings of unworthiness. When we get depressed, our feelings of self-worth and our value plummet about as deep as they can. And that's exactly what happened to Elijah. Verse 4, he said, it is, it is enough now, Lord, take my life, 
for I am no better than my father's. He was feeling a complete loss of self-worth. Next came feelings of help, helplessness and hopelessness. We read that in verse 10. So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. I'm the only righteous one left. I've been very zealous for you, but I just can't do this by myself anymore. You ever been there before? Where you feel like there's nobody else out there and that you're doing it all alone and that you just can't do it by yourself anymore. That's where Elijah was. He was feeling helpless and hopeless and thought that he was all alone in his troubles and in in trying to accomplish uh, his purpose and God's will in his life. Next, number six comes illogical negative feelings. Verse 14, we find... Elijah saying this, The children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, killed all your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Well, that's kind of a dichotomy, isn't it? Because on the one hand, he just asked the Lord to take his life. But on the other hand, now he's fearful that he's going to lose his life. That's what happens in depression. Those kind of dichotomies of uh, those kind of irrational emotions where we're fearful of losing our life, but on the other hand, we're somewhat suicidal. That's exactly where Elijah was at that particular time. Next, still talking about illogical negative feelings, verse 18. Yet I have reserved, here's the Lord talking to Elijah now. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. The Lord reassuring Elijah about his negative feelings. The Lord tells Elijah, wait a minute, you're not the only one. You're not alone in this. It's not all on you. I have reserved 7,000 just in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Verse 2. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I don't make your life, as the life of one of them, these are the same gods that he just defeated on Mount Carmel that she's swearing to. She's swearing to the false gods and to Baal. I swear to these gods that I'm going to kill you. But these are the same ones that he proved didn't even exist. So here he's got these negative feelings. God is reassuring him, but his fear of Jezebel has completely taken over his emotions. So he had just prayed to die, but he was afraid that Jezebel was going to kill him. So which one was it? If you are depressed, when you are stuck in depression, you need to get help to get unstuck. 
When you're stuck in depression, you need help to get unstuck. But what kind of help do you need? You don't need a therapist or a psychiatrist. Well, let me let me clear that up. Sometimes it may help to go to a therapist or psychiatrist, especially a Christian therapist or psychiatrist, if you are if you are suffering from severe clinical depression. But if you'll follow the model that God gives us in his word, it's not necessary. Okay? When you're stuck, know where to get help from to get unstuck. Go to the doctor. Make sure there isn't a medical problem. Make sure it's not thyroid, postpartum, chemical imbalances, so on and so forth. Getting unstuck may require a combination of the following resources. Medicine, counseling by a trained professional, uh, a devotional life, fellowship in the church. It may require repentance for sin, uh, personal discipline in our thoughts and in our choices. And that is, of course, the most important, a fundamental in the Word of God. We are transformed by having the Word of God in our head. We are made new creatures in Christ by having the Word of God in our mind. This transforms our heart and this changes the emotions that we feel. Now, I'm going to, we're out of time, so I'm going to stop here today but I want to remind you now uh, about my my dog at home I'm gonna go home after service and I'm going to find him still under his blanket I'm going to find him still depressed still hanging his head if he does get up and wander around he'll be looking all around him and finding the nearest place to hide But you know what always, when he gets like this, you know what always cures him? If the grandkids come over, or if somebody comes to visit us, and it takes his mind off the fly, suddenly he's his old self again, at least for a little while. Suddenly he's prancing around like a puppy. Suddenly, he has no problems until the company leaves. So we need to work on depression, and we need to work on it uh, not just removing the source of our pain, but moving forward to what is God's will, His plan, and His purpose in our life. Because remember, in the beginning I said that overcoming depression is a matter of faith. When you trust in God enough to do exactly what he tells you to do next, that's when we start to crawl out of the hole of depression. Let's stop there. We'll pick it up again next week.